to be able to come back. Blessing to see all of you and glad you're here to have our band doing their thing and our singers doing their thing and our departments doing their things and God doing his thing. He just wants us to do our thing. Amen. So let's do our thing tonight, all right? Amen. Father, we love you and we thank you. It's a great day. Great day to be in your house. Great day to be alive. Great day to be a Christian. Great day, God, that we can gather and sing songs of praise unto you that we can speak of you through the word, and that, God, you will speak in return and fill us with everlasting joy. And that's what we want tonight. So we'll begin by giving you all praise, thanking you for this moment in our lives, a moment we'll never be able to live again. So we're going to do the best we can with this moment that we have in time. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love lifted me. I was sitting here thinking as we were singing that song is sometimes when you're going through things there's just not any words that you want to hear that's going to comfort you sometimes you just need a hug you ever been that way and it's just something about the hug that just comforts you that's what I think about when I hear that song just love lifted me nothing else no words no nothing I don't need to hear yours just hug me right just just hug me <laughs> and that's what Jesus does for us amen <laughs> sweet sweet spirit
Father, that's exactly what we want to do tonight. Forget about ourselves, forget about tomorrow, forget about yesterday, and begin to just concentrate on you for the next few moments. God, you have so many things that you want to share with us, wisdom and knowledge and understanding. You have blessings you want to pour out on us physically, spiritually, emotionally. And God, we're in the right place to get them. We just got to concentrate on you. We got to focus on you. Not take our eyes off of you. Not take our ears off of you. Tonight we focus. And that is a choice we make. So God, let us focus, be prepared, receive, and let us bless you ahead of time and thank you ahead of time for what you're going to do for us in the next few moments. Thank you for that, God. We sure love you. Amen. Amen. Before you sit down, I want you to turn to somebody and tell them this. I thank God for what he is going to do for me tonight. I thank God. Now look up and say, God, I thank you for what you are going to do for me tonight. Now look inside yourself and say this. Do what God tells you. And don't be disturbed. You didn't do that one very well. So good to see all of you back tonight. I thank you for being here. And I also thank God that we had this opportunity and that we're going to worship him and praise him tonight. And God's going to do something great. Amen. Amen. Last time, Doe's trip, the 22nd, to McLean House, a great place to eat. Wonderful place to eat and fellowship and have a good time. The Doves are making that trip the 22nd. You have to sign up tonight. Last chance tonight. Don't call a few for days from now and say, well, I meant to. I was going to. Well, we'll say, well, we'll think about you while we're eating. Yeah. <laughs> sign up tonight. And if you're 55 or older and you are not a member of the Doves, you need to be. Amen. All right. See Jimmy and George tonight and sign up with them. Um, open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6. This morning we read verse 16. It said, And then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thy servest continually, he will deliver you. Now let me backtrack real quick. Daniel was a Jewish slave that was out of his homeland. No family, nothing. He was in a foreign land. He had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that we know of. I'm sure he knew some of the other captives, but the Bible focuses on them. They were chosen to be certain people in the kingdom because God blessed them with great wisdom and knowledge. Every Christ Christian should look different than the world. Amen. Amen. At times I'll have some of the kids come to me and they say, I made a, a B, I made a 99, I made this. And I said, well, I believe that all of God's children ought to make good grades. Mia was at the house, so they were, Stephanie, and we were, and we were Gracie, and we were talking about grades. And you know, same thing. I said, well, I think all Christians ought to make good grades. I do. You ought to separate yourself from everybody else. We have to focus and do good. But Daniel, it says, the king said, the God that you pray to continually, continually. See, that struck the king. He, he recognized that about Daniel. This was a man of God that constantly was in touch with God. And as it, as it turned out, Daniel was going to need all of that. He got promoted in the kingdom uh, to different levels, and he was working his way up, and the king made him... Uh, uh, one of the governors of the 120, he made him a governor over them. Daniel was always in a high spot, not the highest, but a high spot. And Nebuchadnezzar had the dream, and then, you know, Daniel comes, he interprets the dream, and the king praises him and praises his God. 
and lifts him up to a higher place. Nebuchadnezzar dies, and Belshazzar comes along, his son, and he's an evil king. He doesn't want to remember what God had done, so he was an evil king. But yet, tragedy fell on him, and Daniel interpreted the handwriting on the wall. He moved him up to a high position in the kingdom, but then he died. He got murdered in his sleep. They killed him. Darius comes in, and this king, Darius was the king of the Meds and the Pers Medes and the Persians, and he came in, and he sets up the kingdom, and he, again, recognizes Daniel for who he is and things he's heard about Daniel, and he raises Daniel up even higher in the kingdom. There were three of them, and finally Daniel did so good that Darius put him over everybody, and that didn't strike it well with those that Daniel were, was over. He found honor and glory everywhere he went. God blessed him in everything he did. Do, do you know people like that? You do? You ever, you ever know people that everything they do, everything they touch turns to gold? I know people like that. Yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't matter what it is. It just, just, they, it just turns to gold in their life. You know, I, I've seen people, and I, I, especially evil people that, that does that, you know. And I think about it sometimes. I say, God, I, I'm sure that you know how to spell my name. You know, I mean, I, I'm not sure you know how to spell theirs, but I think that you put that in the wrong box. That should have gone in my P.O. box. You know, but, but I've seen it happen, and, and they, get, they get just all this stuff, worldly stuff, and they got everything they need. There are people like that. Well, Daniel was one of those people, except Daniel, everything he touched turned into great for God. It wasn't for Daniel. So every king recognized him. Every king blessed him. Every king lifted him up. But Daniel never got puffed up. Daniel never got the big head. He never went around boasting who he was. He never made fun of of the others, he never took advantage of them. Now, you can tell me that's not in the Bible. And I'll tell you those words aren't in the Bible, but I'll tell you this, Daniel's life was proven in that they respected him. They didn't necessarily love him, but they respected him for what he was and what he stood for because he kept getting elevated. And even those that were under him, they respected him. They honored him. They knew who he was. And finally, when they got so mad, they said, well, let's just see if we can't destroy him and kill him and get him out of the way. That's what devil, the devil wants to do with all of God's people. If he can, get rid of us because we cause so much trouble for him. So we're going to get rid of him, and they tried everything they could, but they could not find one single skeleton in his closet. Anybody here got skeletons in your closet? And what we do, we try to seal that closet door so they can't get out. If nobody ever knows, we'll be all right. So skeletons, but they couldn't find any. All they could do was say that he was a good man, he was a great man, he was an honest man, he was, a guy full, of God, he was full of God's wisdom and honor and glory. He, he just, they couldn't find anything wrong. He said, he doesn't do anything wrong. Nothing. You ever had anybody tell you that about you? When I was asleep. When you were asleep? <laughs> Think about that. Of all the positions he held... Of all the things he did, he never let it get to his head, and he kept doing what was honest. It just seems today that as soon as a person gets in a position where it's big, the first thing you know is he's doing something on the side to get money from these people over here. And he begins to get wealthier and wealthier, and he hides it. doesn't want anybody to know it because that's a skeleton. But unfortunately, it comes out, and they find out. But Daniel, they said, we can't find anything wrong with him. So I tell you what, since he can't do anything wrong and hasn't done anything wrong, why don't we go after his religion? I think we can get him there. That we can. I don't know. I, I, I assume the air conditioner is running. I, I don't know. Stephanie, you want to try to adjust it, or Becky wanted to make sure it's running. I don't know. I don't want you to be hot, but I can't help it. No. <laughs> you go outside, Jimmy. 
get, get you, somebody give him a phone and let him watch it outside. <laughs> it's, uh, I haven't even got to the part that's going to make you sweat yet, so I really want you to cool off a little bit. But Daniel, they said, hey, we can't find anything wrong with it, so let's go after his religion. And boy, I wish that, that, I wish that our church, I wish me to begin with, but I wish that our church could be so much in love with God that people couldn't find wrong with us. They said, so let's go after his religion. Let's go after that religion. Now, they didn't call it Christianity. They called it religion. So they went after his religion, and they knew that Daniel prayed three times a day. They knew that without fail, he prayed three times a day. Is there anybody in here that prays without fail three times a day out loud to God? See, so they, they knew. They knew about Daniel. He did. The kingdom knew about Daniel. So the king, they said, let's just make a law. And the law says nobody can ask anybody of any person, anything of any person other than you or their God. They can't ask nobody for nothing for 30 days. Sounded good? Evil things attract evil people. Evil things look good to evil people. I wish you'd write that down. Put it on your mirror. That's good. So they went after Daniel's religion, and the king said, okay, that sounds good. Let's just do that. Here's the puffed-up king. He's wanting all the attention on him. You can't ask anybody, and you can't pray for 30 days. So the king liked that because evil things attract evil people, and he signed the law. And you, the law was irrevocable. It had no exceptions. It was point blank. It was online. And they, when he found out about Daniel, he was very upset because he happened to love Daniel. But he threw him in the lion's den. And remember I told you this morning, he said, that, may the God that you pray to continually keep you in safe and sound. He was asking something of another God. He needed to be in the lion's den because he just broke his own law. You see, evil people, when they do evil, they'll get caught up in their evil. Have you ever seen anybody... Don't think of anybody in particular. Ever seen anybody that lies? Then they got to tell another lie to cover that lie, another lie to tell that lie to cover that lie, and they forgot where they started lying. So now that you, know, yeah, I know people like that. They had Daniel, and the king comes back and says, "Daniel, where are you? Are you okay?" And they bring him out, and they kill the people. Now that's Daniel. If anybody had any reason to have a big head and to swell up and to turn against God full of pride, it was Daniel. He had every opportunity in the world. But God looked at him as a young boy and he said, my hand is upon him and I will bless him as long as he lives for me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I love them. My hands on them, and I will keep them as long as they serve me. And he knew that down the road were some great trials and great tribulations they were going to go through. Do you know that God looks down the road for every one of us, and he sees what we're going to go through? He already knows. He's already prepared everything that we need to get through them. It's just we need to learn to pray like Daniel did to be ready. Daniel prayed constantly. He lifted up his voice Constantly. And they said he went up there and he'd open those windows and he'd pray towards Jerusalem. Years ago when we, Brenda and I went to the Holy Land and Susan went with us, I remember waking up the next morning. We flew all night and I remember waking up the next morning. I didn't wake up. I took the cat nap. But I remember the next morning I saw people started moving around the plane. And it was, it was different religions and they would get in certain places in the plane and put their mats down and they would turn in a certain direction and they'd pray. And, and I thought, man, that's, that's really something. I did not say it was good or bad. I just said that's something. But here you see Daniel the same way. Open those windows and pray out. He was a concern. So this morning I ask you, what kept Daniel from having a bad reputation? What was there in Daniel's life that kept him on line with God? And number one we said was his, was his character over comfort. Daniel strived to have a great character. Character is something that once you lose, it is hard to get back. Amen. you got to protect your character. And what is your character? It is the way you live, the way you talk, the things you do, the things you see, how you communicate with people, your character. I am a child of God. And the moment you go out and sin, you've messed your character up. 
God wants us to be pure. He wants us to be holy. And the only way we can do that is through his divine love, his character. So you've got to keep your character. You don't need the comforts of the world. We think we do. Remember, evil attracts evil. If we're children of God and we love God and we're serving God, these evil things that the world presents, they will not they will not cause us to go after them. We'll say, no, I don't want that. I don't need that. When we, need to, we need to know how to walk away. I, I've already had <clears throat> somebody ask me, would, would I like to go kill a deer illegally? It, you know, nobody will ever know. God knows, doesn't he? Some things in life just aren't worth it. Why do you have to cheat to get ahead? Because evil attracts evil. See? And when we get out of fellowship with God, we're in trouble. We're in trouble because evil looks enticing. We've got to make sure that we stay in fellowship, stay in communion, and realize that I want the character of God more than I want the comforts of the world. Because I can stay straight as long as my mind's straight, my heart's straight. I can stay straight, and I can learn to say no, no, no. And the more that I'm saying no to the world, the more I'm saying no, not your way, the more I've got great character for God, the more God is filling up my bank account. Yeah. And you have to believe that. And it may be in dollars. It may be in something else. But whenever we're doing what God says, he said, do this. He said, seek me first, first. Seek, seek his righteousness, great character, and all these other things I will add unto you. So the opposite is if we don't seek God, if we don't live for God, if we don't do for God, our bank account's running dry back there. And then we're going to start belly aching and complaining and griping because, God, I've been serving you, this, 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 and this. You know, no, God says, no, you haven't been doing it. Look at your character. Go to the mirror. And you'll know why these things are happening. So that's the first thing. Make sure that your character is strong and that you don't lose it. It takes courage to do that. The norm of the world we don't need. We're different. God said you are a chosen people. You've been called out. I've separated you. I've given you something the world doesn't have. So don't look like them. Don't act like them because you are not of them. Character. The second thing is... Daniel loved God more than he loved life. Amen. Now think about that. He loved the Lord more than he loved life itself. It says, <clears throat> Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other presidents and all the other governors, for he had great ability and the king began to think of placing him over the entire empire as his administrative officer. This made the other presidents and governors very jealous, and they began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling his affairs so that they could complain to the king about him, but they couldn't find anything to criticize. He was faithful and honest and made no mistakes, so they concluded our only chance is to get his religion. Now, understand that Daniel's religion was God first in everything I do. God's will, God's way first in everything I do. Not just some things, everything. He proved it by beginning by saying, we don't want to eat that food because that food is not going to be good for us and we don't want to do it, so we want to do it a different way. Even with food. The simple things in life, Daniel said, no, we're going to obey God. Obeying God is, is, is something that's really hard for a lot of people to do. Now, you can tell me, no, I don't have any problem obeying God. We don't have any problem obeying God in, in the small things. But it's the big things that get us. It's the big things. And we don't want to do it because we can, we can justify, well, God, I do all these things here. We're talking about the little things. I do all these things here, but it's the big things. Daniel learned in life, to love God more than anything else in life. Now, I could ask you, do you, do you feel that way? And, and every one of you, I'm sure, yeah, I love God more than anything else. Okay? I'm sure we'd all say that. And, and we mean well by it. But what does loving God mean? 
There's the problem. We say we love him. But what does that mean? What, what is loving God? Keep my commandments. Okay. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's no problem. We, 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 we love God. Therefore, we keep his commandments that we want to keep at the moment that we're doing something that's not wrong. When we're not doing something that's not wrong, well, I'll ask God to forgive me later on. See? We got this little thing in the back of our head called the devil. He's always sitting there trying to justify things. Daniel loved God more than he loved life. And Daniel knew that whatever was going on in his life, God was the reason for it. Now, how many of us in here tonight know that your relationship with God and your relationship with people is because of a God that's looking down on you and blessing you? All right. Now, what about those of us who are suffering? How many of us that are suffering know that God loves us and he's looking down and we're riding his perfect will? Amen. Yeah. I heard you. I'm trying not to look at you, but I heard you. But see, we, we have a real problem. We can say it, but we don't act it. Any little thing puts us off. If I don't have that cup of coffee in the morning, just don't bother me. You just wait till I get it in my system. Once I get it in my system, I'll talk to you. Other than that, leave me alone because I'm a bear. Yeah? But that coffee makes me become a little old kitty cat. And that's the way we live with God. As soon as I get that from God, that blessing, that money, that appreciation, that healing, then I'm going to praise God. I'll be strong. But until then, leave me alone. I love God, but I'm telling you, I'm just, <laughs> you see, that's the way we live. So people know that you're professing to be a Christian, but you're griping and barely aching and, and taking shortcuts in life. And they see that. But worse than that, God sees it. But we still love God. Don't forget that. Daniel loved a lot. He loved God. Daniel loved life. You can't ever make me believe that Daniel was thrilled about being on the menu for the hungry lions. He wasn't thrilled about that. But he was thrilled about loving God. How many of us care whether we live or die? How many of us need to repent for the lie we just said? We just thought, because you lied. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Do we really want to live or die? I, you know, we, we, I want to live. Guarantee you I want to live. I want to enjoy people. I love preaching. I love being around all y'all. The latter years of my life have been some of the best years of my life, especially in this church. I don't, I don't want to leave you. But you know what? I love God more than I love y'all. And it doesn't matter to me whether I live or die. And God knows that. He knows I'm not just shooting words out there. I can't be effective for him unless my love for him is greater than my love for my life. Amen. See? So I put it out there for God. And I say, God, I love you. And I want to do everything you want me to do. And if I do that with a clear heart then God will pave ways for me that will take me through some of the toughest storms of my life. Amen. But I'm not going under. I know that. See, I, I have one of those holy... Um, I lost it. Life preservers on. And I can't go under. See, I'll always be on top of the storm. The storm may take me to heaven, but I'll be on top of the storm. There's not a storm in this world that can kill me. There's not a one of you out there that can kill me. Can't do it. Because I have the armor of God. Amen. God will take me. And he may do it through you. But you can't do it. Amen. You see, what do I have to fear? What does it matter whether I live or die? You see, my love for God is greater than my love for me because I know who God is. I know what God's done in my life. I look back and I can see this trail of blessings and memories back there that are my hope for tomorrow. 
And Daniel said, I can live for God. And whether I go to the lion's den or whether I fall out of my window while I'm praying doesn't make any difference. I'll be dead either way. But for me to die is gain. Because when I die, I'll be in heaven. If, I'm not, if I don't die, then God's going to be down here on earth with me. I win either way, win-win. And that's how he felt. So he immediately just went up to his windows, threw them open, and began to pray. <laughs> he knew they were looking, but he didn't care. Because he didn't do it for show. But he did it to let God know that, God, I love you and I trust you. And if my way is through the lines, then blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. If my way is through the fire furnace, blessed be the name of the Lord. Right. Whatever it takes, God is there. Amen. And whenever we start following God, he just opens doors like you can't imagine. You just can't imagine. I, when back in 1977, when I moved back to Waycross, I came back here and I didn't have a job. I didn't have anything, nothing whatsoever. But God had everything lined up. All I had to do was walk his path. It got bad. Money got low. Times got hard. I was afraid that Brenda was ashamed of me, that I'd let her down. But it didn't matter. You just keep walking. And all of a sudden, there's a little golden nugget, and you pick it up, and you go, and there's another golden nugget, and you pick it up, and there's another golden nugget, and you take it and give it to somebody else. You know, you just go on. You just, and God always makes a way. Yeah. Today, he's still making a way. And he will make a way for me until I go to heaven, and he'll make the way for me to get to heaven. Amen. I'm blessed. Amen. See? But I understand it came from God. Right. I'm nobody. It came from God. And God loves us. So Daniel loved God more than he loved his life or the things of this life. It was all a trick to get Daniel. The whole thing was a trick. And Daniel didn't fight. You don't find anything in the scripture where he ran to the king and begged for his life or nothing like that. He, he was content. No problem. No problem. Now. Uh, Brody, come here just a minute. Where's Brody? I had to wake him up. Come here, Brody. <laughs> I'm on the floor. Y'all can't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> Stand right there. I'm gonna have both of them spell a word for us. <laughs> Spelling's easy, right? I hope so. Still. Yeah, good. All right. Spell Nebuchadnezzar for me. N e b u c h a. I think it's d. N e z z a. Nah. <laughs> I'm sorry. No problem. Watch this. <laughs> Brody, spell God. <laughs> you see, that's the way it is with us as, as Christians. See, God doesn't throw these things at us that we can't do. If I give her a second chance, she'll get it. Okay? Yes, she will. Okay. All right. <laughs> So she's worried. She was fretful about the word I was going to ask her. And then she sees, see, G-O-D. We need to learn to live our life with Christ so much that nothing out there surprises us. We're at perfect peace with God because he is handling it. Yes. Amen. See? Stephanie, you spell Nebuchadnezzar. What can I say? Tish can do it. Tish, can, Tish, you spell it. <laughs> nothing to it. <laughs> they they love God more than you do. See, it's nothing. To it. <laughs> no, the the thing the thing is, with God on our side, we don't we don't have to worry about what we're going to face. 
we can be just as cool as Brody, G-O-D. <laughs> got another, you know, just that way. And we got to learn to do it. Daniel loved God more than he loved anything in this world, so life was easy for him. He just did exactly what he was supposed to do, and he never faced a situation that got him. D death didn't get him. None of these things got him. The trick didn't get him. None of them, because he just worked for God. We got to learn to be that. Thank y'all. We got to <laughs> learn to be that way. So Daniel just did it. Now, let me tell you what a person who loves life, when your first allegiance is to God, think about this for me. When your first allegiance is to God, you're going to love God more than your ambition. Amen. Amen. Okay? Second, you're going to love God more than you're wanting to be accepted by other people. Amen. Third, you're going to love God more than you pursue power or possessions. You're going to love God more. Amen. See, that's why we need to learn to just trust God. Just throw our love on him and walk as Daniel did. And don't be surprised. God will take care of everything in your life. Loving God is an option. Loving God over anything else is an option. And you're the one that makes the choice. We need to be self. We need to learn to deny ourselves rather than be self-serving. Daniel was not self-serving. Uh, he could have been, he had all the rights to be, but it wasn't about Daniel. It was about God. And I, I want this church to get that way. God says joy comes in the morning. Let me give you something real quick before I give you the third one. When we love God more than we love anything else, then we will find that we become strong in Christ. Strong. We're one thing, then in Christ we're another thing. Let me give you two illustrations that God gave me real quick. Number one was Paul. When Paul was living in sin, when Paul was Saul, he went across this country destroying, killing, murdering, and imprisoning. Anybody that was a child of God or professed to be or acted like it, he just threw them in jail and killed them. As that man, he took life. When Paul, when Saul met God on the Damascus Road, and that great transformation took place, when he got up off of his knees and he went, and God began to fill him, as a child of God, he no longer took lives, he gave life. Think about that. Evil takes, Christianity gives. Paul could take a life out here, but with God, he learned to give them something that could give them life rather than take it. Amen. And what about, what about the second one is Peter. No, Samson. I'm going to use Samson tonight. Samson was called of God to be a judge over the people, but he had this one real big problem. It was love of women. He pursued women, and women became more important to him than God, a trap that probably most all of us men have fallen into. And with women, it would be men, same difference. And we cast our lot on getting the right one and doing whatever we have to. And, and today, oh, I thank God that I was brought up when I was brought up. Daniel uh, Sampson chose to go into sin and to turn away from God. And when Daniel did that, he became a weak man. And in that weak state of Samson, he brought himself down. Now look at this. This is interesting. When he turned away from God, he brought himself down. And we see a picture of him tied to a pole going round and round and round all day long, grinding grain, just like a pure animal. He brought himself down from that holy person God created down to the lowest level. And when Samson went down, the people that accused him went up. 
Then God got a hold of Samson. And Samson cried out. And God began to renew his strength and his power. And Samson said to the boy, take me to the pillars on the temple. And there he stood in that pillar. And as a man of God, he pushed those pillars apart and brought the people down. And he went up. See, in sin, we bring ourselves down. Ourselves. But when God gets a hold of us, we bring sinners down. There's a big difference in that. Love will do that for you. The third thing that I want to look at tonight is what kept him, be, uh, what made him such a great man was he had great discipline. He did not like disorder. Great discipline. Discipline is something I've had problems with all my life. I, I remember years and years and years ago, David and I went into the insurance business, and I couldn't make it because I didn't, I didn't have any discipline. I couldn't make myself do what I had to do. And uh, when I had free time in my hands, I would use it for me and not for the business. I, I was just not disciplined. And besides that, that's not where God wanted me. But the fact is, I wasn't disciplined. And I think that a lot of things in our lives, we're the same way. We're not disciplined. Daniel went to those windows and prayed three times a day in towards Jerusalem. He was disciplined to pray. He understood that prayer was communication between him and God. He needed that communication because Daniel didn't know what was laying in front of him out there. So Daniel kept praying. And you can just imagine Daniel's prayer. God, help me to stay humble before you. God, you have blessed me in so many ways. I don't want to be something in this kingdom that I'm not. I want to be a child of God in the midst of all this sin and this wrong. I want my light to shine for you. God, I love you. And God, I thank you. Think what his prayers must have been. Through those windows open, and he'd stand there and he'd pray unto God. Was it for show? Daniel was communicating with God. He was very disciplined in his life. Daniel didn't go to places he shouldn't go. You can see that if you read the story. He didn't go to places he shouldn't go. Daniel was always disciplined to do what God told him to do. When the king said, you know, we, I'm going to kill every astrologer, every magician, and Daniel was one of them, he said, I'm going to kill every one of them. He said, bring them here and let's murder them. Daniel wasn't afraid to stand there before the king. He didn't know the answer to that dream. But he said, if you just let me alone, let me think about it, my God will give me an answer. David said, I didn't come to you in flesh and blood. I come to you in the power of Jesus Christ, and God will slay you today, Goliath. We've got to get our things straight. The biggest struggles in our life, we know we cannot overcome them. There's not a one of you in here that can get the virus and overcome it. You can't do it. But God can. See, we have to understand that we don't run afraid because we understand in life God is bigger than anything that we're going to face. I don't care what it is. And when God says, go here, we got to go there. When God says, go there, we got to go there. When God says, do this, we got to do this. We can't say that. Well, God, I, I don't know. I don't want to get it in front of everybody. And I, you know, God, and I, you know, we, no, we can't do that. When he says, you know, you ought to go to choir. Well, I can do just as good right out here. Besides, they have to stand too long in that choir. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I just can't do that, God. And you will never be able to do it until you trust God in your life to do what you can't do. Amen. 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 Church, you might as well get behind this. He's disciplined. Discipline comes because you know that you have power somewhere to help you do those things that you cannot do on your own. Amen. I watch some of our young people in the church. I watch some of the rest of you too. And we're up singing and you're sitting down. And you said, I'm just so tired. And I get over on the side of the pulpit and I stand through the song service, and I stand through this service. And you know why? Because I know that those things I can't do, God will do them through me if I do what I'm supposed to do. Amen. What are you facing in your life that you're afraid of? What are you making excuses for? What is it you're not disciplined in? Well, I just don't have the time. just don't have the time. I just don't know that I can. Talked to someone one time, and they said, I'm going to start coming to church. You can count on that. I said, I'm glad. I'm glad to, glad to see that. I'd be glad to have you. And they said, well, you still going to welcome me back? I said, oh, come on. I, I, I'll have a seat for you. You come on back. Well, I'm, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to be there. I said, good. You got an hour and a half before the service starts. Well, 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 well now, I, 
uh, it'll probably be next Sunday. Uh, I've got some friends coming. You see, there's no discipline. We talk a good talk, but we don't walk a good walk. What is there in your life that you need discipline in? What is there in your life that you're weak on? You see, what you do is you take that and you turn it over to God and you say, God, listen, on my own, I can't do that. On my own, God, I don't feel like doing that. On my own, God, I don't know what I'm going to say. On my own, God, I don't know how they're going to react. God, you know I'm tired. God, you know I don't feel good. God, you know if I could just sit down, I'd be better. God, you know I don't have that much money to give to the church. God, you know I'm just living on, on pins and needles and whatever. Not pins and needles. I'm living on something, crumbs. And God, I just can't afford to pay my tithes right now. But I will. You know, what is it that you're not trusting God with? My son and my daughter, they've gone and they, they're just out there in drugs. There's nothing we can do about it. Where is the discipline in your life? To say, my God is able to do anything and everything that I speak to him on, and I believe that my God can do it. He can do it. Amen. My God can save my daughter. He can save my son. He can save my mother. He can save my wife. He can save my marriage. My God can. Yes. And when nothing else will work, my God can. And I'm disciplined to say that every day of my life. Yes. We're not disciplined. We hunt excuses for not going, excuses for not doing. Because we're not disciplined. We say, God, I love you when we really have been blessed by God. Amen. Easy to do that when you've been blessed. Oh, yes. It's easy to stand up and testify when God has saved you from a tragic wreck. Amen. It's easy to testify when God raised your son up or raised your daughter up. It's easy to testify when God brought you back from the virus. It's easy to testify then. God says, I want those people who are disciplined. Excuse me, I didn't mean to spit on you. <laughs> I, I'll back up. I want those people that are disciplined that can say before it ever happens, God, I trust you. Whatever goes on in life, it's okay with me because you're in charge. I'm just following the leader. God, I know you can heal me. God, I know you're going to do this. And I'm going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil because I know you are there with me. I know it. It's called discipline. It's discipline. Sean, you, you, you and Dale, it's discipline right now that you stand firm. You will not, devil. You cannot, devil. It's discipline. And discipline works when everything is going good and when things aren't going so good. Discipline doesn't depend on circumstances. Discipline depends on whether or not you trust God. I will confess it. Well, what if she dies? I confess my God, is no, he's alive and well, and he knows what he's doing. I trust my God. Amen. I trust my God. Amen. Yea, though she walks through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not let her stay there alone because my prayers will send God there. Yes. Discipline. Amen. Discipline. Amen. We've lost it. Somehow or another, we just don't want to stand and be strong. I can't. It's so easy for us to run with. I can't. I, I just don't read much about it because I don't understand it. What well, discipline says that if you will pray, God will give you understanding. Amen. 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 Discipline says if you don't understand, call your preacher. Give him a chance to tell you. Amen. Discipline says if you don't understand something, go to your parents and let them tell you. Huh, my parents are ignorant. <laughs> See, no discipline. Discipline helps us to walk places where we cannot walk on our own. And every time that you go in one of those places, God sends something or someone to you to give you the very thing that you need in your life for that moment. He sends those people. And you can never, ever be sent to someone until you're willing to send to someone. You'll never be loved by someone until you love someone else. Totally, fully, unrestricted love. I just love you for no reason. I love you. And give. That's the way we treat God. Discipline is knowing that when the church doors are open, you're here. I don't care how many times you've been in the past. and done, Every time the doors are open, you're here. That's discipline. Well, if I'm on my deathbed, well, you still ought to want to be there. Yeah. You know, and I understand. I, I like to go off, too. I like to do other things. But discipline is called where we realize I am going to do what God wants me to do. 
discipline. Daniel had it. He was strong. And there was never anything he faced that he feared he couldn't do. Tell me my dream. Duh. Tell me my dream. Tell me what that writing on the wall is. No other person in the kingdom could, could understand the writing. Nobody. Tell me what it says. Daniel wasn't afraid. Give me a minute. Let me talk to God. I'll get back with you on that. <laughs> and he came back. And it was a bad, bad message. But Daniel wasn't concerned about how bad the message was. All Daniel was concerned about was doing what God told him to do. He, he interpreted the message for him. Discipline. He was always the same wherever he was. Daniel had to be quite a character that we need to be more like in our lives. Let me give you three quick th things. I got two minutes and I won't make it. We need to be disciplined in our tongue. Amen. Got the men on that one. Yeah. We need to be disciplined with our tongue. More people <laughs> are run down by the tongue than by automobiles. Amen. Smallest member of the body, the most unruly and the hardest to tame, Daniel said, the Bible says. We got to be disciplined. The tongue kills relationships. It kills friendships. It destroys the church. Amen. We got to understand. We've got to learn somehow in our own lives to get disciplined with our tongue. Well, I tell you what I think. I just really tell you what God thinks, because that will keep us closer together. Well, when I had it, i tell you what I did. I'd rather you pray with me and let me know what God's going to do. Amen. Our tongue. And we don't think anything about it. Our tongue. We don't think a thing about it. Somebody trying, somebody trying to tell you something, and you butt in, and you're talking, and they're talking, and neither one of them's listening, and neither one of them cares. See, our tongue, we've got to say something. we just got to get the last word in. Got to say it. Why? Somebody's telling me how bad they feel, and I can't wait for them to shut up so I can tell them how bad I feel. Why? Why do we want to do that? It's our tongue. We've got to make sure that we control our tongue. I saw somebody write this down. It said, great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events. Small minds discuss people. Amen. Isn't that interesting? Great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events. Small minds discuss people. Second thing we've got to be very disciplined in is our devotional life. Devotional life. We won't have a show of hands, but we gripe and complain about them taking the Bibles out of, out of schools, right? We gripe and complain about them taking prayer out of school. It makes us mad. But then how many of us have a prayer life at home with our family? How many of us read the Bible with our family at home? You see how we get messed up? And we don't think anything about it. We think if we can protest something that they did that was bad, that's Christian right. We can protest that God was pleased with it. God is pleased with it. But he's very displeased because of the very thing we're protesting against, we don't even do ourselves. We've got to be disciplined in our life. I think, I think that what is happening in America today is because of the moral decay of America. Amen. And the moral decay comes about because of the Christianity decay. We're just not lost trusting God. We're not serious with God. People aren't listening. I went to church Sunday. What did the preacher preach on? Uh, the platform. <laughs> See, that's about the extent of it because we don't listen. Then we go out of here. We can boast and brag about being in church, but God wants to know, did you learn anything? Then he gives us a test, and we fail the test. You see? So, our devotional life. And the third thing and the last one is simply, we've got to be disciplined in our church life. Amen. In our church life. How many of you know that you need the church more than the church needs you? Amen. Daniel understood that. 
You need God more than God needs you. Amen. We can boast about, huh, I'm the pastor of Cattle Creek Church, huh? And that and a quarter won't even buy me a cup of coffee. See, if we're going to brag, we boast about God. We don't boast about who we are and what we are. I'm, I want you to know I'm chairman of the board of stewards. I'm chairman of the board of deacons of my church. And the board of deacons, that's a spiritual group of the church. And they elected me above all them other sorry people. And I'm the man. Yeah. You see? What, is, what does that get you? It gets you an evil heart with pride. And you're going to have a great fall. Daniel understood that. We've got to be disciplined in our church life. Why do you come to church? Just think, why do you come to church? It's the thing to do. Mom and Daddy made me. I want to go to heaven. You know, we, we give all these things. I want to see my friends. You know, all these things. And we've missed it totally. Why do you come to church? To learn about God. Yes. To draw closer to God. To learn how to be freer in God and be what God wants me to be. To realize I can, wor I can worship God by raising my hands. I can worship God in silence. I can worship God in prayer. As long as I give all that I am to God, God directs my life. Oh, I can't wait to get to church. Amen. You see? Why do you go to church? Why do you not want to go to church? We've got to be disciplined in our church life. Guys, if we can do this, I guarantee you our lives will change. And we will never, ever be the same again. Daniel did it. He learned how to use the gifts that God had given him. And Daniel, in the end, learned that all things were possible with our God. I, I've told you this one time before. I'm going to read this, and then we're going to pray. Brian Free and Assurance, we had them here one time at our church. They sang a song once there was a king that thought he got it right Daniel wouldn't last until the morning light they led him to the dungeon and they threw him in he was on his way to supper and the meal was him but God knew how to change their dinner plans never throw a hungry lion in the den with a praying man <laughs> so pray Daniel pray that's the way you make it through. Come on, pray, Daniel, pray. Don't let the devil get the best of you. Your troubles aren't as bad as you thought they were. You can tame a lion, let your prayers be heard. Your faith is going to have them eating right out of your hands. Never throw a hungry lion in the den with the praying man. When you hear their stomachs growling, do what Daniel did. Call up to your father like a little kid. Tell him that they are big and you just heard them roar. Then get up and see your faith or use your faith to block the door. When the fur starts flying, they will understand that you never, ever throw a hungry lion in the den with a praying man. So pray, Daniel, pray. That's the way you make it through. Come on, pray, Daniel, pray. Don't let the devil get the best of you. You can tame a lion and let your prayers be heard. Your faith is going to have them eating right out of your hands. Never throw a hungry lion in the den with a praying man. That ought to be every one of our, our lives. Never let the devil come in the heart of a praying man. Never let the devil come into the house of a praying man. Let him try, but he has no power if we stand on God's word and do it right. We can be like Daniel and be winners in God's kingdom if you just follow the rules. God, I thank you for Daniel. I thank you for his story. I, I thank you for all the things you have shown us through this. He was an awesome man, went through trials and tribulations that we can't understand. I promise you that. But God, what you gave us a glimpse of was the power of a man who loved the Lord more than anything else. Can that be said about us? That's our choice. The past is the past. We can start today to be the man and woman you've called us to be. So, Lord, I ask you to touch every one of our hearts. And know that there's no sin that we've committed that cannot be forgiven. No wrong that we've done that cannot be forgiven. That God, you will clean us and pick us up and begin to help us to live a life of joy and victory. If we'll just have faith and courage and put you first. 
Help us to do what you tell us, and then let our lives begin to shine for you. God, I love you, and I thank you. Praise you for this church, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.